Well, we're going to go to the Word of God unless the Holy Spirit says something different. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Bible scholars perhaps already know where we're coming from. We're going to read chapter 7 and a few verses. Uh, let me see. We're going to read verses 12 through 14. Are you ready? Beginning at verse number 12, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night thank you, and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Together. If, if my, my people, people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and, pray and, and seek my face, and, and turn from, from their, their wicked, wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Precious Father, we have a prescription now for restoration as a nation. So we thank you, Lord God, that it is good for our nation today and for the nations of the world. We thank you and give your name to glory. Be glorified through your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Praise God. You may be seated. We want to talk briefly about prayer. Prayer, as you know, we talk a lot about prayer. You placed that on my heart this time. Again, for the TV audience, I was talking to the Lord about each time that we have to talk to the wider audience in the Hampton Roads, Tidewater area on the outskirts of Carolina, always seeking him as to what is on his mind. What is it that we need to be reminded of? And so he brought that scripture to me. And so we are going to talk briefly about prayer. Prayer as a whole prayer that is sufficient for a nation, a church, individuals, leaders, prayer as a model, prayer. Prayer is talking to God. Simply put, it's talking to God. And in the book of Hebrews, the Bible says, he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And throughout the Bible, there's at least 300 times or more that word of prayer is mentioned. And so it tells us that it's very important in the eyes of God We've talked about, I was going back through some of the themes that we talked about for the last few months. We talked about children who are angry with their fathers. We talked about healing the sick. We talked about um, rebellion. We talked about anger, we talked about rejection, so many things we've talked about that God spoke about. We've talked about the disciplines of prayer and fasting. 
talked about increasing our knowledge of the scriptures, the knowledge of God, the value of it. A lot of things that he's brought to us over the years. We talked about healing the heart. We talked about submission to God. We talked about God, his love, how he loves us. And we are to emulate that. And so there's a lot of things that uh, God has spoken to us. And each time that he speaks, he's given us a solution to whatever we may be facing. And as we see it that way, then we will give him our undivided attention, knowing that God knows us and he knows what we're facing. Am I right? And so this Bible here in Second Chronicles, written from a priestly point of view, the Bible says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I've heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. And Solomon had, on the scaffold that he was, he was praying at the dedication of the house of God, he was praying and offering so many sacrifices to God. And as he prayed and asked God to remember Jerusalem, remember that place. And he talked about that Jerusalem being a place where the presence and power of God dwells. And he said, uh, he gave some instances where or if something would happen if there was no rain, if pestilence, plagues would come, if the crops failure, if uh, he would allow locusts or grasshoppers to devour the land, if Solomon said, if, if your people which are called by your name, if we would turn toward Jerusalem, this place, and pray. And then he said, God, will you hear from heaven? And if we've been put to the worst before our enemies, he said, but if we turn and pray to God, he asked God if he would remember Israel and restore and heal Israel. And then this was God's response to Solomon's prayer. He appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence, among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God is a God of restoration. He always has our best interest at heart. What I've just read is a prescription for a na nation that may be in peril. Israel, the nation of Israel, God made this promise, promise to Solomon because Solomon was praying on behalf of Israel that he could have some assurance that should Israel be put to worse or locusts or plagues, uh, pestilence would come to Israel's way that they wouldn't be devoured, but if they would repent and turn toward God, God would hear. So they recognized, Solomon recognized that ultimately God was in control, right? And so he prayed that prayer. And I remember David saying, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and the inhabitants that dwell therein, right? For he found it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. So it again reiterates the fact that the earth belongs to God. 
when Jesus came, he mentioned that you cannot serve two masters. He said at best you will either hate one and love the other or you'll cling to one, despise the other. So then he encouraged them to seek or pursue the kingdom and his righteousness and the things would be added. Are you with me? So it still talks about God reigning and ruling over all. So as a nation, a nation should pray when they're in peril. I heard at times of war when our nation was facing other nations, uh, I believe it's recorded that they had people of prayer there on the scene, front line, to pray before our army, nation's army went to war. Somehow God has a way of reminding us what's more important. Am I right? Sometimes we can major on the minors. We can place our times and our value on things that yields so much less results. Only to discover there's futility or emptiness, right? But once we focus in on that which is more valuable and pursue God, then God gets involved. Are you listening? There is a way that seemed right to a man, but the Bible says the ends thereof are the ways of death. But there is a way that is right to us. And I believe prayer is one of those ways. So as a nation, he gives the uh, possible problem, no rain, locusts devouring the land, plagues, Things that come like cancer and leukemia and lupus and uh, a lot of diseases that are now here which the doctors have not been able to cure. If it becomes widespread in a nation so that people begin to fear for their lives, there's an answer, there's a solution. Thank God he didn't leave us without a solution. Uh, there is help always in the Lord. This was important to Israel for them to understand what God was saying. And I believe if our nation today would pause and turn from its ways and truly honor God, God would cause a lot of the things that are happening in our nation to stop. I truly believe that. Uh, but as we look at what Solomon, God said to Solomon and to Israel, the problem we just mentioned, the solution God said would be if we or if the nation of Israel would humble themselves, that was number one. Uh, and I thought about that. That was the first thing. He didn't say pray first. He said humble self. Uh, I've discovered that sometimes the reason we don't pray is because we need to humble ourselves. I believe that many times people will strive and do their best to handle things on their own until they are completely until they are completely convinced that they can't change things and once that a person is convinced that they cannot change a situation then many times I said many times they will look upward for help there are people that are not saved in our world today that they go on for a long time as long as they can master things. They, they, if I can put it like this, they have no need for God. But once a loved one that's dear, their hearts is uh, near death or their business is crumbling and they 
attempted to lose everything, whatever the situation may be, they tend to look upward. It is a shame that it takes something like that for people to turn to God, isn't it? It is good when we can hear him and walk with him on a consistent basis, isn't that right? I believe God has a way of keeping things that would harm us away from us if we would get this principle first and foremost. But in the goodness of God, if that for some reason we don't grasp what's more important, then he does allow things to take place to get our attention. Are you hearing me? I remember one time when he told me, he said, son, when you face things, I, I expect you to come to me. There is an expectation from God when we face things that we cannot handle. And many times that's a good thing because sometimes we wouldn't look upward as we ought to if we weren't facing something. Are you with me? And so God being so good loves us to come into his presence so that we can get the aid that comes from him. Apart from me, he said, you can do nothing. All right, and so we, as we looked first and foremost, he said, humble self. Self has to be humble. I have to. You have to grasp and understand that, that apart from God, we can do nothing. And we are placed in this world, and we have been given life through him. But the sustaining life will come from him also. Isn't that right? Give us this day our daily bread. Praise God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So God makes it clear through the scriptures that there will always be a need for us to depend on God. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so he said, humble self. Self has a way of feeling like it can get along right without God. So thanks be to God that he reminds us of that which is important. Then he said, pray. It's, it's not, uh, uh, it's, it, I, I discovered that if I don't humble self, then adequately I cannot pray. You hear what I'm saying? It takes a dependent attitude that I, I cannot do it alone. I, I need to find out what God wants in this situation. I need to find out what God wants is saying to me by allowing the plagues or the, the things to happen to me. I need to understand that so that I will pray and talk to God. And then the third thing he says, seek my face, finding out the will of God. And I heard Jesus said, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto him. Look at somebody said, I always must put him before things as a kingdom person. Now, as a person in the world that does not know any better, they don't know any better. But for Christians, for people that are called by his name, for sons of God, we must understand what's more valuable. We are living under a new or different value system. Are you with me? Our values are not the same as those that are of the world. Why? Because we have been delivered out of darkness, out of ignorance, unto light, knowledge, understanding, truth. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So since we have been enlightened, if you will, if we, since we have been illuminated, uh, since we have gained some understanding and some knowledge and uh, insight, so we walk according to that which we've understood. God forbid that when I've been, I've been illuminated or enlightened, that I would walk in ignorance after I've been enlightened. Isn't that right? It is all the wisdom to walk in the light. Hallelujah. After we have been illuminated. So, with that in mind, seeking his faith and then turn from our wicked ways. All of our ways do not please God. There are sometimes there are ways that we may have that does not please God. And God in his goodness has a goal in mind to bring us to a certain place in him while we live here. And eventually 
ultimately to be with him to live forever. Some of our ways don't always please God. The best of us sometimes there is a room for improvement. Are you with me? Whenever I get to the place where I feel like there's no room for improvement, then it must be time for God to take me on out of here. Are you with me? So we must have an attitude that is teachable. Somebody say teachable. I must remain, you must remain teachable so that we can always learn. Did you get that? You must be teachable in order to learn. Isn't that right? All right, so he says, humble yourself and pray, seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways. And then he would do something so ma- fantastic. We, he would heal our land. Now we talked about the, the prayer as a nation, but let's go and look at prayer as an individual. If you'll turn to the book of Luke chapter 18, we'll talk about prayer as individuals and the Bible has this to say about the gospel of Luke and he spake a parable verse 1 unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God neither regarded man there was a widow in that city she came to him saying avenge me of my adversary and he would not for a while but after what he said Within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night to him, though he bear long with him? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, nevertheless. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith? And in the Greek, it means faithfulness. Will he find faithfulness? People that are still trusting and calling on God, no matter how difficult the situation is, will he still find faithfulness among his people? Or will he find weariness? People are tired of calling on the Lord because they haven't gotten the answer that they really wanted. So Jesus said, nevertheless, although this is true, when the Son of Man come, shall he find faithfulness? Will the person that trusts in God still be trusting in God? Will that person still be looking upward in the midst of what they're going through? This is basically what he's saying. And so this is an individual. So as individuals, he said, he spoke this parable to this end, to this intent, for this reason, that men ought always to pray, not lose heart, not feel like giving up. Isn't that right? Not willing to throw in the towel because there is help in God. We can come boldly to the throne of grace so that we can find mercy and obtain of obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need there is a throne that we can approach there is a throne that has mercy and grace in abundance and so as often as I need it sometimes I feel weary in my soul but then I, I must know that there is strength in God there is a refreshing in the presence of God isn't that right there is refreshing so that I will, I will not grow weary and stay there. I will know and understand that there is God. And in my presence, he says, there is fullness. Somebody say fullness. Fullness of joy. Not a little bit of joy, but fullness of joy. And at my right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Somebody give God a praise. Hallelujah. He's a right now God. So as individuals, we have a prescription. And James goes on to to say it a little better. And let's listen to what James said concerning individual praying. He says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? 
Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Look at this prayer. So he's pointing out Elijah was a man just like we are, same like passions. And he prayed to God, and God shut up the heavens for three years and a half. What a prayer, what a prayer when you can pray and God shut up heaven. We know that that was in accord with God's will, but he still points out the fact that he was an individual. Isn't that right? And so as individuals, we can pray and not lose heart. Now we go on from prayer as a nation to prayer as individuals to prayers as heads of the household. All right. So I look in the book of Acts. And I'm going to go to Acts 10. Prayer as heads of the household. Heads of the household could be a man or a woman if there's no man there, right? Prayer as heads of the household. We have here chapter 10. There was a man, a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming in to him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spoke, spake to Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. And if you read the remainder of that, cha that chapter, you will see God dealing with Peter at the same time. And so Peter had a vision from heaven. A sheep come down three times, had all kind of unclean animals and meats in there. And the Lord spoke to him, but he was dealing with him at the same time he had dealt with Cornelius. And Cornelius was sending angels of the men, his servants, over to find Peter. And the, uh, the angel told him exactly where you can find him. Gave him specific instruction. And to make a long story short, God brought salvation to Cornelius and his whole household. So sometime as heads of household, we need to be in place to do what we ought to do. Isn't that right? We don't have to sink in despair. Even as heads of the household, we can pray. And if we pray to God continually, consistently, and persistently, God says he is a rewarder of them that will diligently seek him. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. So we don't pray in vain. When I come to prayer, then I must believe that God hears my prayer. Otherwise, there's no point in me praying. Isn't that right? I pray because I believe. You pray because you believe. Isn't that right? The Bible tells us to pray. Hallelujah. It is written that God said that men ought to always pray. Never give up. Don't lose heart. There is strength that comes from the Lord. Look at your neighbor. Said there's always strength that comes from God. So as the head of the household, let me give you one more. As head of the household, uh, the Bible tells us here 
in the book of Job, chapter 1 here. We talked about praying as a nation. We talked about praying as individuals. Now we're talking about as head of the household. Job 1 says there, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. There was born to him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job Continually. Are you hearing me? As head of the household, the Lord wants us to know that we, through prayer, can change things. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now we move on from prayer as head of the household to prayer as church leaders. And look at Acts chapter 6. Prayer is for everybody, isn't that right? Acts chapter 6, the Bible says here. And in those days, verse 1, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the da daily administration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples to them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we shall appoint over this matter, this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Prayer as church leaders it is vital, isn't it right? Uh, God makes it very clear, and the apostles here, all 12 of them, Peter speaking for them, was saying uh, it's not suitable, it's not proper that we should leave the word of God and do serving tables and take care of these natural matters. Are you hearing me? He said that you choose out people that's full of the Holy Ghost, and they need to be full of the Holy Ghost. Don't just choose people. Because the business of God requires Holy Ghost from start to finish. Yo, you, you, did you hear what I said? You, you can't just choose carnal people to work over spiritual matters. That, that, that don't work. Are you hearing me? Because a carnal flesh will rise up against God and it's not subject to God. And sometimes you, talk, I don't know why I'm going this way. And sometimes you put a carnal person over something and they'll try to carry something out carnally and, and mess up things. Better. But he said, you, those that you choose, although those matters may be less matters, make sure they are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Because the church business requires people that, come on, Larry, what you talking about? People that are full of the Holy Ghost from start to finish. You, you can't get a maintenance man that, 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 that uh, 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 don't have no Holy Ghost in him. S sit him down. He, there's no place for him to be trying to use and do spiritual matters. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The church is spiritual. And it requires spiritual people. Somebody give God a praise. I know there are some churches that do they get a person that got a little money, got a little education. I'm not against those. I'm an educated person. But my education is not priority. It is the Holy Ghost. It is the Spirit of God that takes priority. I don't care how much knowledge I get. I need the Holy Ghost. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
Because let's say I got two degrees, two, two PhDs, and that's all good for this world. But let me say this here. But when I get ready to fight demons, a PhD, it ain't going to it ain't going to deal with demons. Are you hearing me? It takes some spiritual power to deal with devils. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Glory to God. They do not respect the degree. Oh, I don't know why I'm going this way here. Hallelujah. They don't respect the degree. But there are some churches um, that they'll, if you got a little money, you got a little education, they'll put you right at the top. And that's why the church is suffering. Because the church failed to understand it is a spiritual entity. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Okay, I did. I know. I, I got off a little bit on that. I, I don't know what. Praise the Lord. So heads of the household is important. And then as church leaders, hallelujah. So Paul said, let me, let me go by. Verse 3, Acts chapter 6. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of, whoo. Let them have an honest report. You can't have a bad background. You know what I'm saying? And. Okay, I ain't going there. Okay. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to pray and to the ministry of the word. This was the church leader's priority, responsibility. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? If the church get back to the way God prescribed it, then you'll see the signs and the wonders like God intended. It. Because it won't be fighting, bickering, and... and yeah, I'm, try I'm trying to... So the problem in the church world today, they don't have men and women full of the Holy Ghost. They got them full, all right. Maybe even full of a ghost. Amen. All right. I don't know, God, I didn't know what you had in mind when you did this. All right, so we move on from church leaders into um, prayer as a wife in distress. All these things God gave me now, so it, prayer as a wife in distress. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. First Samuel chapter one. See, this is prayer for look at smart. It's prayer for everybody. All right, not only for a nation, but individuals or heads of household, leaders in the church. Prayer can, is important as a wife in distress. First Samuel chapter one. Look what he said. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten. Let me go back a little further. Verse four. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters, portions. But to Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord has shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret because the Lord has shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now El Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept sore. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget your handmaid, but will give to your handmaid a man child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake. In her heart, only her lips moved. 
but her voice was not heard. Then Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said to her, how long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance, glory to God, was no more sad hallelujah she prayed through look at somebody say she prayed through hallelujah glory to God as a wife in distress Hannah is a typical model of how when Satan the adversary is provoking us harassing us that we can pray until God and when that request comes before God, God will answer our prayer. And so he, as you know in the Bible, her problem was her womb was shut up. But she prayed and God opened up her womb. Hallelujah. And that problem was sobbed forever. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And then the Bible says again in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, he tells us how to function as God's people concerning prayer. And it's found in 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In other words, always be praying. Hallelujah. Don't pray when it's popular alone, but pray. Let it be. Let it be a lifestyle. Hallelujah. Calling on the Lord, seeking God. Hallelujah. God is always the answer to our problem. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. And he's eager to help us. I was talking to the Lord on yesterday, crying out for the needs of God's people. And God said, I, I want to wholeheartedly. I want to. And I had to pause and say, well, God, what is it? And then he brought to me, he said, if my people, which are called by my name, Humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. Turn from their ways. Bickering and fighting and murmuring. Complaining. Ah, turn from those ways. He said, I will hear. I will hear from heaven. I will heal their land. I'll forgive their sins. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. I am the Lord. I change not. Come on, join me in praising the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me show you, you again. Hallelujah, in Acts chapter 12, prayer is very important, saints. Uh, prayer is spiritual. And we that are spiritual must do spiritual things, isn't that right? Hallelujah. So he says in Acts chapter 12, concerning the church, the church needs to pray, isn't that right? I, I know we, we, we live in grace, but the church still need to pray, isn't that right? See, when you pray, prayer is the key to the kingdom coming. Prayer brings on kingdom power. Prayer brings on kingdom blessings. Prayer, are you with me? So without prayer, God is limited to what he is able to do. Acts 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. 
And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, somebody say the devil, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now, you see how if, if, if the devil's not stopped, what he'll do? Then were the days of unleavened bread, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions, quaternions of soldiers to keep him, and intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but, somebody say but, prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter wasn't worried he was sleeping. Somebody said, don't you know you're going to die in the morning? Boy, you, you better get up. And... But he was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, I, I believe, let me pause. I believe Peter was able to sleep because the church was praying without ceasing. I believe that he was able to pray in the midst of that evil that Satan was planning for his life because the church was praying without ceasing. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, verse 6, And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers of, before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And you see, when, when the angel touched you, he doesn't need no key to unlock the cuffs. You know, they just fell off. When an angel is on the scene, they are not limited by natural matter. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the angel, verse 8, said to him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not or knew not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. See, that's sometimes when God is doing heavy stuff. People can't be in their full awareness because they can't, somehow they may act up a little bit. <laughs> and so he, he came upon him, it was like he was in a trance. He thought he was dreaming. God had to put him in that state in order to do what he had to do. <laughs> All right. Verse 10, when they were past the first and second ward, he came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of his own accord. They went out. See, the angel got right close to the gate. And all of a sudden, the gate just opened. Iron gate. Now, it didn't just happen. There was an angel on the scene. It's so powerful. And then went out and passed on through one street and forth with the angel departed from him. After he freed him completely. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and have delivered me out of the hand of Herod. And from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. See, he had to take Peter. And Peter was not fully cognizant, right? So after he delivered him, then he brought him back to his senses again. Sometime when God is moving supernaturally, he has to kind of protect us because, you know, this natural part of us just act up. What? What in the world? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but he couldn't do that because he wasn't cognizant of really what was going on. He just felt like he was in a dream. The angel was leading him and freeing him up by God. Then, when he considered the thing, verse 12, came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door, the gate of damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. When she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said, oh, are you mad? You crazy? 
Now, mind you, they're praying for Peter. They are praying for Peter. And she said, Peter's at the door. You crazy girl, you know. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, oh, it's his angel. <laughs> Sometimes we pray we're not expected to ask. <laughs> Look at somebody say, but the Lord is merciful. <laughs> You know when we pray in unbelief, we sometimes people <laughs> sometimes people pray so hard and they don't a bit more believe that they're gonna do. <laughs> but the Lord is merciful, isn't that right? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. But Peter, verse sixteen. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoned to them with a hand to hold their peace declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Wow. Hallelujah. Church, when a church prays, things happen. You see, we, we, we don't really understand what we're all about. The Bible says, and he, you have to quicken who were dead. And trespasses and sin. Where in time you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. But God, who is rich in mercy, Amen. hallelujah, have raised us up together and made us sit together. That's a place of authority. Whenever you see a person sitting, when a king sat on his throne, he was ready to operate in authority. And so when he made us sit together in heavenly places, that means we are there in Christ in a place of authority. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we, we, we as a church, many times we don't understand what God has done through Christ made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. There's a work to be done, so God gave us power and authority. And he sent his disciples out, 12 of them one time, or 70, and the Bible says he gave them power and authority over all demons to cast them out and cure diseases. Hallelujah. The works that Jesus did, he said, you shall do also. And greater works shall you do. Because I go to my father. Hallelujah. Because he went, because Jesus, the Bible says, remember what Jesus said when Satan came before he had offered his blood, died on the cross, before the work of Calvary was done. Satan came and told him, all this power I'll give to you if you'll bow down and worship me, for I've received it. That's what he said. I've received this power, this authority. Although he got it illegally, he got it in the sense when Adam sinned, right? So he was saying, oh, I, it's been given unto me, this power. So Jesus didn't say, you don't know what you're talking about. He knew that it was true, what Satan said. So he didn't rebuke him. But then, after he went to the cross, he rose again, and when he appeared to his disciples, the story has changed. He said, all power in heaven and his earth is given to me, is given to Jesus now, if Jesus is our Lord, and if we are in Christ, he said, therefore, go ye into all the world and proclaim the gospel, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they'll drive out demons. 
They'll speak with new tongues. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Every person that's a believer in this house is for you. I want to pause right now. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to say, God, forgive me for not fully understanding this. But with your awareness, I will walk differently in your power and in your authority through Jesus' name. Now give him praise for that. Would you praise God? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. So he sent out the 12 and he sent out the 70. He commissioned them. He deputized them. And so they went out. And as they went out, there they saw things happen through their lives that they had never dreamed. They were casting out demons. They were healing sicknesses and diseases. Uh, just, and it was phenomenal. And they, they got so excited. Oh, my God. They came back to Jesus. Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. This is incredible. I'm enjoying this thing. This is what will happen when we go and preach the gospel. To the lost. Are you hearing me? When you share the good news to somebody that's not saved, the miracles and the signs are to point people to him. That's one of the reasons why they are prevalent when you go. Because God wants the unbeliever to know that he's real. And so one of the ways that he chooses to cause them to know it's when he does things that they know no doctor can do. And it defies the logic. I remember one time we was preaching at a tent meeting there with another pastor. And there was a lady that had just a portion of a lung. I don't know how that happened, how she could be living. But we led her to the Lord and the lady cried out, I can breathe. She was so touched. She said, I can breathe. I can breathe. I can breathe. Just led her to the Lord, and while Jesus was coming in, he healed her. Oh, there was another situation where the lady that had been, had something going on for 30 long years. She had some art that she couldn't get rid of. We led her to the Lord, and the lady cried out, Oh, 30 long years have I suffered this, and God took it away. You don't know the signs. You don't know the power of God um, that when we go, when we just go, it may be in the school. It may be in the marketplace. It may be in the park, wherever it is. But when we go, just tell the love of Jesus Christ. God so want people to know that his son died. So you can have life. I don't know about you, but it was a moment that I had when I was this week. I said to the Lord, Lord, I am enjoying your blessings, perhaps like I've never enjoyed them before. But you know something? It's not good enough for me just to enjoy the blessings. And I begin to think about the church and many in the church that's not enjoying the blessings of God. Made me cry out to God, God, what can be done? What can be done that everybody will begin to enjoy God's power and his presence in whatever way he chooses? It's the will of God. And like I said, God said, he said, I want to with my whole heart. I want to. It is God's will. Hallelujah. That we be freed up from the things that holds us back. It is the will of God. Jesus paid a price. That everybody would be free that believed in him. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the church must pray. Look at Jesus as our model. If nobody else look at Jesus, you know, he's our model. Isn't that right? We look to him as to a perfect 
the perfect God man how to function. And I want you to look in Luke chapter 6. Here's what the Bible says. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. This is Jesus. And continued all night in prayer to God. Prayer is essential. Prayer is important for the believer today. Jesus being our model. Hallelujah. Matthew 21. I'm, I'm winding down. Matthew 21 tells us about God's house. God thought it so important that he called his house a house of prayer. Look at verse 13. Verse 12 said, And Jesus went into the temple of God, cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. God thought it so important that his house would be called a house of prayer. Over 300 and some times the idea of prayer is mentioned in the Bible. Prayer is essential. The Bible tells us that Elijah was a man subject to like passions. And he prayed and God did wonders. God wants the church. Did you know the church is called? The priesthood. The church is God's priest. God has made us kings and priests to God, his father. The Bible says in Second Peter, or First Peter, chapter 2, verses 9 and verse 5, we are a kingdom of priests. And the thing about a priest is he have access to, for God on behalf of the people. Isn't that right? We are priests. And so God looked for every believer who have been given access to God to activate that purpose, become prayer warriors. Years ago, I was talking to the Lord 20 years ago. I said, God, what, what is it that you really want for your church? And God says, you know what I want? He said, I want an army. He has an army in heaven, isn't that right? The models down here on earth, almost every nation has an army, isn't that right? A nation without an army is deplorable because they stand in risk of being not a nation or being taken over by others if they have no army, isn't that right? So God says, you know what I want? I want an army. I want a people that can pray, that are militant. People that understand who they are. A people that will fight in the spiritual realm. That's what I need. And finally, I'm saying this. There was a man whose church was flowing. and Souls were being saved on a regular basis. Power of God was there to help people get delivered of every kind of condition. A minister came over to see what was going on and if he could learn some things from him. And he said, come down in the basement. I want to show you my heating system. So the man, he took him down in the lower parts of the church. And he saw a host of believers praying in the Holy Ghost praying so profound and profusely. The man, all he could do was grunt. He said, my God, but he called it his heating system. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you just understand what I'm trying to say, God has given to us power and authority, but it must be utilized. It must be utilized. And when we can come together and pray, it's nothing God can't do. God, sometimes his hands are tied as he watch us try 
to do what he only can do. But when we come together in prayer, my God, God's hands are untied and he begins to flow and move by his dynamic power. God can do anything. Hallelujah. He said, if my people, hallelujah, call by my name. Oh, no, don't, don't, don't look to the church government, to the, to the local government or to the regional or the federal government. That, 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 that's not the answer. And thank God for our government. Isn't that right? But it's not the answer, hallelujah, to awakening, to a revival. That's not the answer. To, it is the responsibility of the church of God um, that has been called out of darkness into light to rise up in this hour and begin to be the church hallelujah and let the people rejoice there is work there is work to be done there is work to be done I hope that each one are hearing what I believe the Lord is saying. He's made us a kingdom of priests. Someone say, but I, I want to pray, but I just, I just don't have time to pray. I, really? Really? Don't have time. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you because you're good. There's so much work to be done, Lord. I pray that the word has found place somewhere and somehow in the hearts of your people. For those that are praying, be encouraged to continue. For those that are not praying, Lord God would have a desire to do just that. I pray, O oh Lord, for those that are watching us by TV, that, Lord God, you'll drop something or deposit into their spirit while the word is going for. I pray for an illumination. I pray for an awakening for the church of God. O oh God, in these dark days, Lord, I pray, oh God, that we'll not look to the government. I pray, dear God, that we'll not look, oh God, and proclaim how bad it is, but that we, Lord God, will look unto Jesus. Look unto the answer. Look unto the solution. Even God, hallelujah, Lord, because you said in your word, you, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I thank you, God. You're the sustainer. Yeah. Hallelujah. Of the whole of the world. Glory to God. Nothing moving except by your mighty hand, O oh God. So we pray now for the hand of our Savior to minister to our hearts. Let revival come in the name of Jesus. Um, that God, all of us, but there's some, specifically you have a ministry of prayer but yet there's some I say some have been kind of sidetracked momentarily and some have not really understood what you're called to but as we're praying today Lord Jesus awaken us by your spirit Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God, I thank you. Oh, God. Awaken us now to the urgency of the hour by your precious spirit. If you're here and you really want a revival in your heart concerning prayer, that is, if you are not flowing in that vein, and the Lord knows whether you tell the truth or not. But if you're here and you heard and something within you says, that's got to be right, and I, I know I've fallen short, but I want to move in that vein from here on in every day of my life. That is, if you are not flowing, clarity I'm saying, if you are flowing, then continue. But if you are not, I want you to come. And we're going to ask God to strengthen you. 
to this very thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He does not condemn us, but he will energize us. He will give us the strength and the awareness and the determination to do his will. Out of prayer will come clarity of purpose. Out of prayer will come assignments. Out of prayer will come peace and joy. Out of prayer will come so many things. Protection. If you are not flowing in that vein, or if you're just weary and you need his strength today to get back on post, come now and God will meet you at this altar. Let us stand together. Thank you, Father.